guy that can pronounce that name, you ought to have him back. <laughs> anyway, welcome, welcome. On behalf of uh, the Chamber and the candidates, uh, we're really happy you're all here. This uh, type of dialogue I think is very, very important. So uh, rather than uh, you hear from me, we're going to ask the candidates to take over. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask each candidate to do two or three things. The first thing is tell us a little bit briefly about your background. More importantly, probably the district, the geographical district you represent, because there are three of them here. There's House District 40, House District 39, and House District 19. Um, and I don't want to overlook our senator, Senator Zahn, who is standing in for two candidates that we can talk about. Um, and then um, tell us, if you would, this is a kind of novel question. We don't care what, why we shouldn't vote for your opponents. We want to know why we should vote for you. What would you do if elected, okay? How's that? And once you get through that, then we got some questions. So let's start off with the far end of the table. Greg, take it away. Well, thank you, Son. Uh, my name is Greg Gustafson, and I would like to thank, uh, obviously, the Urbandale Chamber of Commerce for this uh, event, and also all of the sponsors. It's, it's great to be here to see all of you here, so thank you for coming. Again, my name is Greg Gustafson, and I'm running for the Iowa House District 19. For those of you that are not familiar with House District 19, it's most of Dallas County. Um, other than Waukee, they, they picked Waukee out, and uh, most of Grimes. Um, but I go back up and I pick up uh, Polk County, I mean Polk City, and I go all the way over to Dexter and Redfield, and I have three districts in Irvingdale, um, precincts 13, 14, 15. So that's a little bit about uh, the district. It's mostly rural. Um, I've been traveling around the, the district for a long time and meeting with voters, and, and I've really enjoyed that. My background is I was born and raised in Northwest Iowa on a farm. I graduated from Iowa State University, uh, came here to Des Moines to work, got an MBA from Drake University, and now my wife and I um, um, own a couple small businesses here and uh, we have around 60 employees. So I've been in this district for 35 years. Um, I think I understand the district, and uh, I think that's why that uh, I want to represent, or the question is why you should vote for me, is that my opponent is, is, has moved and, and uh, into the district. And I've lived in the district 35 years, and I think I know and understand the people out there, and I think the people out in our district, my district, deserve, as all voters do, that the representatives understand who they are and what they're about rather than just moving out for a, a political party or, or a political organization. So um, I care about what they, what uh, the, the constituents want. They're interested in Medicaid, they're interested in healthcare, they're interested in education and water quality. And those are all issues that are very important to me and, and uh, what my parents told me growing up on the farm that I need to push through the legislature and uh, um, that's very quickly who I am and why I'm running. Thank you, Karen. Is it me? <laughs> uh, is this bad? So I do want to tell you a little bit about my background. 
Uh, my husband Jeff and I have lived in Johnson for the last 19 years. We have three children, David, Joseph, and Carlene. Uh, Jeff is a letter carrier with the U.S. Postal Service. Service He has been for the last 25 years. One of the reasons I decided to run is because my family and I have had so much opportunity in Iowa, and I just want to make sure that other Iowans have the same types of opportunities that we have. Uh, my parents were small business owners. They owned a small, bit, a small manufacturing company in Beeman, Iowa, which they operated for over 20 years. Um, I went to the University of Iowa after I graduated from college. I worked in human resources for over 15 years. In 1997, I picked up a master's degree in public administration with a specialization in healthcare administration. Uh, but I always kind of dreamt about going back to school full time to become an attorney. So in 2004, thanks to a very patient and supportive husband, I started at Drake Law School. At the time, I was 41 years old. Uh, we had three kids at home, the youngest was two. Uh, two and a half years later, I graduated with highest honors and I fulfilled my dream of becoming a lawyer. Uh, after that, I worked in um, Better? Oh, there we go. After that, I um, clerked for Justice David Baker on the Iowa Supreme Court uh, for a couple years. And then I was with the Whitfield and Eddy Law Firm for a few years. I prosecuted dependent adult abuse cases for the state of Iowa. And from 2011 until just earlier this year, I was in-house counsel with DHI Group, which is a company that has a large office right here in Irvingdale. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of different things with my career, and I think that that um, experience, that breadth of experience, will serve me well in the Iowa legislature. And what I want to do is, is get there and represent uh, our district. I promise you I will be there, and I will listen. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Zahn. I'm in the Iowa Senate. I represent Urbandale, Johnston, and Grimes. I'm here to, excuse me, I'm here today uh, to fill in for Chris Hagenow and Jake Highfield. Um, I can tell you that I've had conversations with them. I pretty much know their voting record. I'm not gonna try to, um, I'm gonna try to communicate the best I can in regards to where I think they would be on the issues, mostly based on how they voted on the issues. Uh, I work with both of them very well and uh, certainly spent a lot of time with Jake Highfield because he represents part of the district that I represent as well as John Forbes. Um, I first want to thank everybody that's running. Um, Karen and I were just talking. It takes a huge sacrifice for these candidates to run, um, not to mention some of the nasty little ads that are out there. I don't know if there's anything really going on right now, uh, but we're in a time when I think it's really unfortunate that uh, there's some things that are said that are just not true and there's no response to it. Uh, or at least it's hard to respond to some of those. So I thank all everyone at this table. John, I don't really thank you because you got a free ride, but um, <laughs> I, and I love John. Don't give me a rock. But you know, uh, just in regards to Jake Highfield, I know he's in Arizona today. Um, I mentioned to Tiffany, she called me about a week ago and said, hey, listen, we'd like to have the other side, uh, the Republican uh, perspective set at this uh, forum, and would I be interested in doing that? And I said that I'd be happy to. And I'll try to do the best job I can for the two candidates uh, that are on the ballot. I'll just tell you a little bit about both of them. Jake Highfield uh, is a young man. I know that when he got elected several years ago, he was the youngest person in the legislature. I think that's important because it gives us a different perspective. Uh, I've seen him grow uh, professionally as a state representative, and, and uh, I know he works hard. Uh, we have, as like most everybody that's in the legislature, including John, we all have full-time jobs outside of the legislature. The legislature is a, is a part-time position where we're in, in session from usually January to uh, April. Uh, so uh, I understand that, uh, that Jake was at a forum a couple nights ago in, in Grimes. Uh, and uh, so uh, he's a good young man, uh, University of Iowa grad, which I love the Hawkeyes. And, and uh, so I want to tell you who he is. And Chris Hagnall is the majority leader in the house. I've known Chris for many years. He's a father of two. He also has a business. He's, a, he's got his own law firm. And I know that he had some kind of scheduling conflict with him come today. So thank you for having me. I'm State Representative. <laughs> I'm State Representative John Forbes from Irvingdale. Uh, I'm serving, or finishing my third term serving in the Iowa House. I was first elected in, in 2012. And 
Previous to that, I spent about seven years on the Urbandale City Council. Um, again, I'd like to congratulate everybody up here too for being able to put their name on the ballot. It's, it's not easy to make that decision. And I know when I, when I just was contemplating whether I was gonna run um, both for city council and for uh, state representative, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to be able to do this. And it takes a very supportive family too. And, and my wife, Cindy, has been very supportive of me over the past few years in, in what I do and give public service and giving back to the community. In the House, I, I currently serve on uh, four different committees. I serve on the Commerce Committee, which oversees the banking and insurance industry here in the state of Iowa. I also serve on Human Resources and the Human Resources Budget Subcommittee, which oversees our state Medicaid program. And that's, that's the majority of what I spend down at the Capitol is working on, on those two areas, I'd say, because I am, as a profession, as many of you know, I'm a pharmacist. I, I own a Medicap pharmacy in here for over 35 years. And so healthcare is a passion of mine in making sure that we uh, provide good and adequate health care to all citizens here in the state of Iowa. And the last committee I serve on is uh, Ways and Means, which is the uh, a committee that oversees our taxation authority here in the state of Iowa, which is very important. And we'll probably get into a little bit more of that. Uh, I'll have some uh, points to make when we get into that part of the discussion. Well, I'm Richard Dior. I'm the independent uh, running in District 19, so the same district as uh, Greg, the other gentleman at the end of the table here. Um, we're in a three-way race, three race, which is not very common in the state of Iowa. Um, so a little bit about my background. I was born in Colorado, but then moved uh, to Iowa. My dad grew up in small town Iowa, so he wanted to raise us, raise us three kids here. Uh, so I grew up in Mason City, graduated of North Iowa Area Community College, then went to University of Northern Iowa. Um, and I was telling these uh, people here this morning that uh, I'm, I'm the case of someone who left Iowa, had a great time, but wanted to come back and start my family. So uh, we do have something good going here, which is one of the reasons why I jumped into this race, um, was to give back to the community that I do love so much and which brought me back. So to answer the last question of, of why you should vote for me if you happen to be in our district, as an independent, I'm letting all the facts guide me. So sometimes that means a Republican idea is the best one, sometimes it means means a democratic idea is the best one, and sometimes, more times than not, it means it's a, it's a mixture of all ideas. And so that's, that's been my position throughout this entire campaign, and looking forward to answering the rest of the questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Richard, why don't you kick this one off, and we're going to do something that's really simple. We're going to ask a very simple question. It's about Medicaid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, the state's privatization of Medicaid seems to be an issue. Uh, do you feel there's an issue? And uh, why do you feel that way? And what would you do to fix it? And maybe above all, how would you pay for it? All really good questions. Um, so just looking, again, going back to what I just said, looking at the facts, do I think there's an issue? Yes. There, there's clearly an issue, both in, in, the, in the treatment and the care that the residents of Iowa are receiving, the quality of care that they're receiving, and the quality of care that was promised. Um, it's not up to par, in my opinion. Um, so what would my solution be? I think there's two solutions. One, we move all back to state care, but I don't think that's really the, the right solution because we're not prepared to retake it over. Um, so to me, the best alternative is to take uh, the long-term disabled population and move them to state care, uh, pay for services model, which we had in the past, um, and, and then hire much more oversight for the managed care organizations, which we are lacking today. Uh, how do you pay for that? We're paying for it now. We're not getting the promised savings, so the money's there. It's just a reallocation of funds. Thank you. John? Okay, well, this is this is a very big topic that's been talked about a lot at the Capitol over the past two and a half years. Um, I serve on the Human uh, Resources Budget Subcommittee, which uh, oversees our almost $5 billion state Medicaid program. And back in 2015, when the governor, Governor Branstad, uh, came to us and said we want to switch to a managed care system in the state of Iowa, you know, I was open at first. I wanted to let's take a look at it. That when we start sitting in on those budget hearings and bringing the experts in to tell us um, things about going to a managed care system, I started having some concerns. And the big concern I had was, was the cost. Um, current, well, when we ran a state-run program, um, Iowa Medicaid Enterprise is what it's called, we ran our state on about a 4 to 5 percent administration fee. And that was about $300 million a year on about a $4 billion program. 
Come to find out that the managed care companies were going to be charging the state uh, anywhere from 10 to 12 percent to administer the same program. So we asked the question, so what value are we going to get by paying an extra, additional $300 million a year uh, to get these services? And they could never really give us a good answer. And so uh, as we went along, uh, when we went into a managed care system, um, I thought, well, okay, the, the reason for managed care is to be able to, to manage the care to get better outcomes for patients. That's, that's what it's about, lowering costs and increasing and bettering the outcomes for patients. Well, into two and a half years now, we're not seeing that. In fact, it's costing us a lot more money. And when, when I, I sat in on the budget hearings this past year, we didn't even know the amount that the MCOs were going to charge us until about, uh, about a month ago. And we should have known that figure back in you know, April when we were finalizing our budgets. And we put in the budget about a 50 to $60 million increase. And it came out just recently, it's $103 more million dollars in state taxpayer money that's going to have to be used to pay the MCOs. That's state money, but there's an additional federal match money that's, that raises up to $340 more million. And again, from the standpoint of providers and recipients of care in the state of Iowa, I don't think we're getting the value that we're, we were really sold on when we were told to build a managed care system. So um, next year, depending on what happens in the elections coming up, um, um, I'm hopeful that we can transition back to a system uh, that is fair for patients and we're still going to have managed care within our uh, population. I think there's some good things, but we're, we're going to need to carve out certain populations that really managed care has no impact on. Because these are the people that really uh, don't get better. They're the people that have long-term disabilities and things like that. So we'll work to try to make our Medicaid system here in the state of Iowa more sound next year. This puts me in a bad position because <clears throat> I don't like this Medicaid takeover, and I voted that way uh, with the Democrats. It's a broken system that we're trying to fix. The good news is, in the last uh, session, uh, you know, we talked to all the providers. They're not getting paid. Uh, we had uh, uh, a mayor health dropout, so then we had a lot of patients or people that were uh, dependent on their services that were thrown out uh, and really struggled to get the services that they needed. Um, the bill that I was very supportive that we did pass this last session was number one, that they are penalized if they don't pay on time. Um, there's still so many providers, I'm sure it's providers in the crowd here, that are owed millions of dollars. A lot of them are health, which we have no, uh, really, uh, we don't have any, we can't force them because they're gone. Um, hopefully that they're gonna get a new, um, there's an RP out right now and they're gonna award another provider, um, but what would I do? I would transition. You can't put everybody back on the state system overnight. It's not gonna happen. We tried to do it the other way, and it was a disaster. I think the most neediest people, uh, in regards to what John said, should be put on, and are on. This, a lot of them are on the state system right now. Uh, I think we need to transition that way, um, and it's unfortunate, and uh, it was done by executive order, and I'm not happy. So let's fix it. And I think there's some solutions to fix it. I agree with much of what um, everyone has said so far. Um, obviously, the Medicaid uh, situation has not worked well. The privatization was not well executed. Um, the people who need the services most aren't getting the services that they need, and uh, providers aren't being paid in a timely manner. This means that we have providers who are going out of business. Um, and, and as I go door knocking, I talk with providers from time to time who you know, have been serving Medicaid patients, but they're thinking about discontinuing that because you know, it's just frankly not worth it. So um, clearly it is an issue. I think there are some things that we can do. Um, I agree that it's not appropriate to have certain Medicaid recipients under the managed care program, uh, so we should be looking at carving some of those things out. Um, and you're absolutely right, there's nothing easy about this situ situation. This is a very complex issue. You know, I work for uh, Broadlands, Easter Seals Lutheran Social Service. I served on the boards of directors of 
uh, Central Iowa AIDS Project, primary health care, community health organization. My specialization uh, with my master's program was in healthcare administration. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but we've got some good ideas of things we can do, and we all know that we can do better, and I think that we need to start making that a priority um, because Iowans deserve better than what they've received. I'll be short, but I, I pretty much agree with everything that's been set up here. We all know that uh, Medicaid is, is uh, it, it's, it's not serving the people that it needs to serve in the way that it needs to be served. That probably is the number one issue of all the doors that I've knocked, the people that are concerned. The, the, their biggest concern is that Medicaid, because a lot of the people that uh, I've been, been talking with have stories that they're telling that the services aren't being paid for, they're not getting the services when they need them. Um, I have, I talked to one lady that uh, is retired and her son-in-law is 35 years old, has got stage three cancer. He had to quit his construction job. Um, he was denied his last radiation payment or his last radiation treatment. Her daughter uh, has to now quit her second job because she's making too much money for Medicaid. Those types of stories and those types of issues cannot go forward. And obviously I don't have all of the answers but I know that there are answers out there and, and, and working with, with both sides, we need to get this taken care of and the people of Iowa deserve this to be taken care of and it needs to be done sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, one thing I forgot, there are little, should be little cards on your table. If you have any questions, please fill them out and someone will pick them up. Um, if there aren't any cards on the table, I'm sorry, you'll have to get a new moderator next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. Uh, let's talk a little bit about education. Uh, it's kind of a lengthy question, but I'm going to try to abbreviate it. Since uh, 2010, the average increase in public school funding has been 1.93%, and statewide deficit for special education in 2015 was $86 million, which was not covered under the uh, school aid formula. Your thoughts about current levels of funding, this is a three-part question. Your thoughts about the current level of funding. If the state's economy grows four to five percent, what specific percentage of growth for Iowa schools would you support? And finally, if your own child wanted to be a teacher, would you recommend this profession given the current state of affairs? Karen, you want to kick it off? Sure, as long as I don't break the microphone. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. I'm a product of public schools. I went to uh, public high school, uh, public university. Coming from a middle class family, you know, I had a world class uh, public university education, been beyond our means. Never would have done many of the things that I had the opportunity to do with my career. So um, our funding at our, our, for our community colleges is very important. Our funding for our region's universities is very important because we want to make sure that uh, those opportunities are available to uh, kids coming from families with limited means. As far as the increase in the K-12 this last year, um, it did not even keep up with inflation, and I don't think that that's sufficient. Um, we need to make sure that our schools are funded to a level where um, you know, we can retain good teachers, uh, we can provide the services that we, that we need to, and uh, that our kids deserve. You know, as I talk to people in this, um, in my district, uh, you know, a lot of people move to Johnston and Grimes because of the quality of our public schools. And my kids have all gone to Johnston High School. The older two have graduated. The youngest is a junior this year. And I just want to make sure that the kids who are um, coming along have that same good public school experience that my families enjoyed. And I also think that you know this community is a reflection of the investment in public education that our parents made. And we should be doing the same thing for, for our children. Um, and briefly, you know, the question about your child wanting to become a teacher, my 16-year-old wants to be a teacher. And I will admit that I have mixed feelings about it. I come from a family of public school teachers. My grandmother was a public school teacher, my uncle, my sister-in-law. I have five nieces or nephews who are public school teachers. Uh, so that probably explains Carlene's interest. Um, you know, I know that with the um, changes in, in collective bargaining last year, 
an awful lot of public school teachers felt that they were very, you know, devalued, and um, you know that frustration that frustration is real. So I hope that uh, Carlene decides to become a school teacher, and I hope that she decides to stay in Iowa, and that we are valuing our public school teachers, um, starting, continuing to the extent we can, improving, and moving forward. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, I would guess that a school administrator wrote this editorial uh, when, with the statement that EJ wrote up, but let me tell you, I deal with facts. Facts are this. Iowa is ranked the fourth best state in the nation for school funding with a 20.6 increase in the total state funding per student from 2008, and that does include the SAVE funds. Last year we did 1%. Um, through the SSA, which is the uh, $14 million in new funds for equity, and an additional $32 million uh, uh, for the, the, the teacher mentoring program. Um, how much, you're asking a question, how much we, what, what would be adequate? I want to fully fund our schools. Uh, what we, we've had a couple of tough budget years this last couple of years. You probably heard in the news yesterday uh, that the estimated revenue service said that uh, our revenues are coming in. I try to base on um, what we need to fund, what we can afford of all the departments. The education department is the only department in the state of Iowa of all of our government that has had an increase in the last two years. In regards to teacher salaries, we rank eighth in teacher salaries. I have all the data here in regards to what the, the medium salary for a teacher in 2016 and in the uh, I have the state of Iowa's $54,416. Now here's what's going on in our public schools. Uh, since this is, this is data provided by the Department of Education, and this is data from 1992 to 2015, there's been an overall increase of 3% in students in the state of Iowa. There's been a 14% increase in teachers, and this is the shocking thing. There's been a 29% increase in uh, administrators. Why do I bring that up? Because, unfortunately, in the state of Iowa, this is based on uh, last year, you break down the money that goes into our classrooms. <coughs> it's been frustrating that our classrooms aren't receiving the money that has been appropriated through property taxes, federal, federal uh, you know, the federal government comes in as, as well as the state. Um, the Iowa, in the Iowa, the average classroom got $251,000. The average salary I mentioned to you uh, is at $54,000. They figure the bricks and mortar is at $35,682. Means there's about $160,000 left over for each classroom. Where's that money going? It's going to administrative costs. Um, I have a sheet here. I live in the West Des Moines schools. Um, and I live in Urbandale. But this is the sheet that I just received about all the benefits that the administrators get. They're not treated like teachers. And it's, it's disturbing in regards to uh, travel expenses. Um, not only do they get the IPERS, but they also uh, get additional uh, retirement, in the retirement. Uh, their dues expenses, their phone allowance, their holidays, their vacation. Teachers don't get this, but administrators do. So that's the frustration that I have. In regards to the teachers, I failed to mention that my wife, Jeannie, is here with me today. Um, she's a former teacher in the Des Moines Public Schools. If there's any teachers out there, I, well, what she tells me and her fellow teachers tell me is let me teach. We mandate every, everything on these teachers. My wife and a lot of teachers spend their weekends filling out all the paperwork that's required by the Department of Education, both federal and the state. We mandate their teaching methods. We mandate the curriculum. Let the teachers teach. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to be a guest lecturer at Drake University. These are all Central Iowa teachers, both rural and urban. And uh, they brought me, I'm a Republican, I'm anti-Christ to some of these teachers. Uh, so I show up and we, get out, and we're there for about three hours. And we start listening to some of the stories that's going on. I said to these teachers, like I said, they're from Central Iowa, rural and urban schools. These are teachers that are getting their master's degree in administration. 
and and uh, I said, if I had a magic wand, I could do anything for you, including raising your pay. What would that be? One hundred percent of them said, "Let me get control of my classroom." Thank you, Karen. I think Brad just talked you into recommending to your daughter she become an administrator. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, education is very important uh, to me as a legislator, making sure that we provide adequate and good education to our young people, all the way from kindergarten all the way through the Regents universities. Um, some of you may know that about 50% of our state budget goes to education in the state of Iowa, and that's around $4 billion a year. Now, that's K through 12 community colleges all the way up to the three Regents universities. Uh, fortunately, we've, and last year we only gave them a 1% increase in spending, uh, which is pretty inadequate when you're running a business and you're only seniors with only getting paid 1% more per year when the um, inflation and everything is running at 2 to 3%. So that's put a big stress on school districts here in the state of Iowa. Um, it's caused about, a, we have about 354 school districts within the state of Iowa. And 183 of those school districts are on what they call a budget guarantee. And that means that when they don't, when their enrollment starts to drop, and it usually is a more of an issue out in the rural areas of the state of Iowa, they have to be able to make up that amount. And what happens, that gets shifted to the property taxpayers here in the state of Iowa. So what's happening is without the state adequately funding school districts, it's shifting more burden to the property taxpayers here in our state. Now, fortunately, here in the metro area, uh, we're in a growing area, so we don't have uh, school districts. At least I'm not aware of any here in the metro area that are on budget guarantee, but you see more of it out in the rural areas. Another concern of mine is with, uh, there's some talk down at the Capitol, and there was a bill floated last year on school vouchers. Now, I'm not against school vouchers, but I want to make sure we're going to fully fund K through 12 education here in the state of Iowa before we start writing checks to, to uh, parents to be able to take their kids to other uh, schools or even maybe in some cases talking about homeschooling. Uh, we have about uh, 10,000 kids here in the state of Iowa that are homeschooled right now. And 70% uh, of the homeschoolers here in the state of Iowa do a tremendous job. 20% do an okay job and 10% should not be homeschooling their kids. And so if we're gonna look at programs where we're going to now start paying uh, parents to be able to keep their kids home, uh, I think that's going to have a negative impact on, on public education in the state because that's going to take away money from school districts now that are currently struggling to be able to provide the services and keep class sizes at a, at a, um, a range that will allow the teacher to be able to get good contact time with each student. So. Um, I want, I'm always going to promote public education and make sure that we fully fund that through here in the state of Iowa. So as I said when I introduced myself, uh, we came back to Iowa because of the quality of life. And one of those elements was and is our great public schools. As someone who went to a community college, the facts also don't lie about the cost of community college here in the state of Iowa. When you look at community colleges all across the country and average their, their tuition costs, compare them to the state of Iowa, we are 35% more expensive in the state of Iowa that has a, an average cost of living. That's just unacceptable. Like as, I, as my family prepares to, to bring our daughter home, um, we're adopting this in December, um, that's important, it's more important to me now as I look at how am I gonna save enough money to send my kid even to public school if not private school. So we do have a challenge here in the state of Iowa. Class sizes, class sizes continue to grow. Starting teacher pay is nowhere near adequate enough to get a teacher to come to Iowa. Um, to be a teacher in our great schools. So those are big challenges. To the question of if we have a 5% uh, growth in revenue, where do we start on the funding number? Well, I, I've talked to some school administrators and I'm pretty frank with them. I say, I don't care what the number is. I really don't. If it's 100 million more dollars because that's gonna get us the results we want for our kids, then that's what it is. What I care about is how we're gonna teach, the results that we want. And one of the things that the state legislature did years ago is they had a, um, task force that was put together to look at new education models. And one of the things that came out of that task force was something called competency-based learning and project-based learning. And uh, the Van Meter School District has fully implemented this way of teaching and this way of assessing their students. 
They still follow all the, the same guidelines, but they teach and they, they allow learning in a different way, which is more beneficial for the 21st century economy that we're in today. Instead of sitting in the classroom with a, with a whiteboard or, or, or a chalkboard, they are doing things that are teaching kids real life skills while doing the education at the same time. Um, so the last part, what I encourage my daughter to become a teacher, 100%. My sister is a public school teacher uh, up in Mason City. Have uh, my mentor is a school teacher. She's actually one of the uh, I forget the name of the program. You guys will know the Teacher Excellence Coaching Excellence Program. Um, she's she's one of those up in Mason City. And I know why she was. She was the most important teacher that I ever had, um, and she stayed in the public school system because she saw value there. We absolutely have to make sure that our system keeps those teachers and encourages those teachers to work for us. Thank you. Uh, yes, education is extremely important, and I do think that we need to increase funding. Um, you talk about administrators. I'm not sure the rural schools are getting oversupply of administrators, um, like, like some of the metro schools and, and, and all of the superintendents that I talk to out there at uh, Minburn and, and DeSoto and, and Van Meter. Um, a 1% increase in their budget doesn't cover their transportation costs to get those students from those rural schools. The, the rural students to, to the schools. So the 1% is, is, is good, it's better than a decrease, but it's not what our education needs. Iowa has been a, a leader in education for, for many, many, many years. We, we all have been a, a, a benefit of that. But if you don't keep putting money into it and keep fixing the issue, it keeps falling, and, and we are falling. I mean, you see that Iowa is not a leader in the ACT scores anymore. You see that the U.S. News and World Report came out and said University of Iowa dropped seven points and, and Iowa State University dropped three points. Well, that's unacceptable. Um, Iowa needs to be a leader and we have been a leader in education for many, many years and, and I think it's, it's a priority issue. Um, we're, we're, we're funding and, and I'm all for big companies coming into uh, the state as long as they're bringing jobs. So you look at my district, Apple's coming in there and we gave a huge tax uh, cut to Apple. That's a priority versus uh, funding the education in, in the district. So um, my superintendents, where I'm out talking, saying that class sizes are going up, they can't find teachers, and surprisingly, I, I didn't even think about it, but they're even having a hard time finding substitute teachers. Um, and so if we're gonna have a quality workforce in this state, and, and if, if we wanna have good jobs, they have to have good education, and that starts at uh, pre-K, K through 12, but it also then goes to community colleges, we have a, a, a small HVAC company and we want to expand. We can't find any HVAC certified people because there aren't enough around them. There aren't enough plumbers, there aren't enough electricians. Community colleges can certainly serve that. And so, yes, we do need to um, increase funding for education. I'm not thinking we need to go four, five, six, ten percent, but it needs to be more than the one percent. It needs to be at least inflation, and hopefully we can do a little better than that. Okay, these are, these are from the floor, so I, we've got six of them, and I'm going to go see if I can get them all, all uh, asked. So I ask you to um, continue to keep it brief. Yeah, continue to keep it brief. Uh, Greg, you've got the microphone. Uh, would, you, would you support making the sale and use of fireworks legal, illegal in the state? <laughs> now, wait a minute. You don't sell fireworks, do you? Oh, go ahead. Would I make it illegal? I, I, I enjoy fireworks just as much as anybody else. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great, great show. Um, as long as, as they're properly fired and they're properly trained people are, are, are setting them off, um, I hated seeing all the people going out into the surrounding states uh, buying fireworks. Um, I'm not really sure I have, have a full answer to that. I, I, um, um, I probably, as long as the, as long as the people are uh, uh, regulated and they, they know what they're doing, that uh, it would be okay. Yes. <laughs> That's brief. I like that. And I think Chris and Jake both voted for it, whether given the city's flexibility to opt out. I voted no for that bill in the House. Uh, 
I probably would have allowed it and, and done what we did, but, but I will say that I don't live in Windsor Heights, but I believe I saw the news that they are going to try to change their city ordinance to, to make it that it's the, the police, if they're called and they get there, they don't have to find the person who actually lit the fuse. Anyone on site would be eligible for a ticket for breaking their city ordinance. And I think that's a, a, a good heavy medium for the cities um, <coughs> if they want the fireworks. Karen? Good. Who's next? Okay. Uh, I've got my own answer to this question, but I won't share it with you. What is the number one thing you would accomplish in your first 60 days, and how would you go about doing it? I would say welfare reform from, this, from the aspect of the cliff. Uh, if you know anybody that's ever been on any kind of governmental programs, there's, I've talked to a lot of Iowans that are trying to get themselves out of being dependent on government services, but they'll take a dollar an hour increase, and uh, unfortunately, they'll lose some of the benefits they have, uh, which takes the incentive away from people trying to get off of any kind of assistance. I think that's a huge issue. That's my opinion. I really don't know where Jake and, and uh, Chris are on that. Other than working on our uh, Medicaid issue here in the state of Iowa, I, I would work to put together a more meaningful medical cannabis program here in the state of Iowa. We did pass the legislation, and Brandon and I have been on the same page on this for, since day one, but what we currently have on the books is not adequate to treat uh, the medical conditions that people need to use medical cannabis. So I would expand the uh, number of medical conditions that would be eligible to be used on medical cannabis and take the cap off on the THC level. I'll jump on both of theirs. I'll support those two causes. Uh, for me, my first 60 days would, would be focused on education. Not so much the funding, but the other uh, training and, and teaching methods that I think we need to implement across the state, and that's gonna cost money, but I think it's an investment worth making. Um, I agree with all those also. The first couple of things I've worked on is obviously getting Medicaid taken care of, and also the cannabis issue getting taken care of. But, Day one, the first thing that I would do is reach out to all of the Republicans and say, hey, we represent Iowa, we need to work together, we need to do a better job of working across the aisle. And I think that's so important and that's not what's being done. So to me, that is a huge issue and that's also one of the reasons why I'm running is because I've worked with the Republicans, I've worked with people that have different opinions than me, and we can come together and we can get things done and I think that's what I'll do. And I agree that Medicaid is our highest priority and that's what we should be looking at um, immediately. Um, I do agree with the, um, your thoughts on the medical cannabis. We need to review that and make good progress last year, um, but we should review it again and, and, and make further progress on it. Well, I think um, here across the state, you know, there, there are cities that have passed uh, ordinances to protect uh, people that are in their city from being um, prosecuted and brought before the courts and things like that. Um, I think it's more of a local control issue, um, and I'm, I'm more of a local control type of legislator. I, I believe that people in their own communities should be able to make uh, decisions how they want to run their communities. Coming from a city council background, I think that works best. So. Uh, I would say it should be local control. Uh, I'm going to actually agree with John that I think the sanctuary city issue is definitely a local issue. Um, if a city decides that that's where they want to go, I don't think the state really has a role in stepping in in that situation. Um, I think the state can sometimes overstep their bounds, and, and I think the more we can give local communities those options and choices, the stronger our communities are going to be. I would agree it is a local issue and that's what needs to be taken care of. And I agree it's a local issue as well. I also have concern uh, about passing laws like this. What kind of message we're saying we're sending to immigrants? And um, I don't think it's an especially um, a welcoming message when, when we pass these kinds of laws. Uh, I also um, thought that the law that was passed this um, last year was, was a solution in search of a problem. Well, um, first of all, the idiots in Washington, D.C. can't fix this problem. It's their responsibility to do that. They're not doing that. 
Our immigration system is broken. Um, generally speaking, most everyone that's here, they're hardworking people, they're honest people. They're here for the American dream. But we are uh, a nation of laws. I did support the Sanctuary City Bill as well as I think Jake and, and Chris did as well. Um, I, as Judiciary Chair, I've had a lot of people reach out to me. Uh, fact of the matter is, is if there wasn't illegal immigrants in the state of Iowa, Molly Tibbetts would be alive today. And we've got to enforce the laws that we have here and not allow local control like it's been suggested. <coughs> So, again, I said at the beginning that I'm gonna let the facts guide where I go. I tell people this when I, when I talk to them on their doorsteps or at forums like this, that if you would have asked me five years ago how I felt about medical marijuana, I would have said no way. But I took the time, I read the paperwork, and I'm on board. In fact, I'm on board with John's plan to expand access and, and the, the ailments that, that our law covers. In terms of recreational marijuana, the data still isn't there. Part of the problem is the federal government doesn't allow the studies to be done to find out the actual impacts of that drug. So until the federal government gets out of the way and lets us test it, we can't, I don't believe, we can legalize it. I'm a big proponent for medical marijuana, but I will not ever probably vote for legalization of recreation use of uh, cannabis in the state of Iowa. And I assume that both uh, Chris and Jake would probably be no on the recreational use, but I know that they're both supportive of expanding medical cannabis. And I'm supportive of expanding medical cannabis. Um, I do not think that we um, need to make recreational use legal, although I do think that we should look at decriminalizing it. I don't always think it makes a whole lot of sense for us to be spending tax dollars um, to you know, punish people for, um, for use of marijuana. I am definitely for uh, expanding the use of medical marijuana. My mother would certainly benefit with the restless leg syndrome. She would greatly benefit from that. Um, and I agree that uh, further studies need to be done on before we legalize reparation use. Here's one I, I'm going to try to, I'm having a hard time understanding it, but I don't have to answer it, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> As the government reduces federal funding for SNAP, food stamps, how do you think local governments can help feed our growing number of people in need? And then it goes on to talk about, for example, food sustainability, food local, uh, uh, locally grown restaurants, etc. I think that's what it is. So pick it up. Karen. Well, Greg gave it to me, so I guess I'm first. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm so concerned about the federal changes that have been proposed around SNAP. Um, you know, the way I view it is, you know, we live in Iowa, why should one child go to bed hungry? Um, and so, you know, these kinds of changes are, are very concerning to me and, and it just doesn't strike me as consistent with Iowa values. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely, you know, following the question either, but I will say that um, you know, some of the things that have been suggested there, you know, make a lot of sense. And, you know, we incentivize uh, businesses to do different things. Um, and, and I think those types of incentives um, would make sense with this type of a problem. We should be encouraging that. You know, people complain so much about all the tax credits that, that have been given to business. And I think to a certain extent, those, those concerns have, have merit to them. Um, I don't think we should do away with all of them, but I do think we should be looking at them very closely to make sure that we are getting the bang for our buck that we that we should be getting with these tax credits. So that might be a way that we could um, address some of those needs. We are sitting here in Urbandale, Iowa, best city in the state of Iowa. And the mayor, I'm looking at him, I'm looking at our city council member there. Thank you for providing the food pantry here in Urbandale. And in regards to SNAP, there are some changes that we can be making. And that's a federal thing, by the way. It's not a state thing. Uh, but there is some changes that I would like to see because I talked to our high V managers uh, that says that they see people come in and buy the five gallon water bottle on SNAP or the, the fancy milk that's in the glass jar. And they go right out in the parking lot and they dump it out. And they bring it back in and they get cash back for that deposit. Um, 
The other thing that's going on is, uh, I mean, Michael Wonerman told me, at pharmacies, uh, with SNAP programs, you could buy a, a $75 Easter basket because there's food in it. I mean, there's, there's little changes like that that I think that need to be done, where I think SNAP's being abused. But I certainly want to make sure that, they, that these, this program and this assistance is out there for the people that are in need. But we certainly want to encourage them to be able to get off that, like I talked about with the clip that happens. You know, um, our local food pantries play a vital role in uh, serving our uh, lower income individuals here in our, in our community around the state. And um, from the standpoint of my, my point, we in, in my in the Democratic Caucus in the Iowa House, we have last couple of years put forward legislation to appropriate a million dollars to the uh, food pantries uh, throughout the state of Iowa. And both times that bill has not um, gotten to the governor's desk. So. Uh, we're hopeful that we know that there's a huge problem of food insecurity within our state. And I know that the churches and uh, very generous individuals around uh, our community and state have really stepped up and, and provided those uh, food services for uh, people who, who really have no other way of uh, obtaining those. So I'll continue to uh, fight for uh, programs that will provide um, food for uh, the people here in the state of Iowa. And hopefully we can get that funding through next year. Uh, yeah, this is a big challenge because, like Brad said, when, when, for instance, if someone you know increases their pay and then they hit the cliff effect and then they all of a sudden can't feed their family, so they got to go a food pantry. All these is this issue in particular has so many different pieces to it that when you touch one, it touches touches a lot. So the, the all these ideas are great ideas. Like let's work with Hydeal, let's work with Fairways, and let's create some kind of incentive program to help the food pantries, to help these families. Let's make sure that that the cliff effect isn't as strong. Let's find a way to help raise the minimum wage if possible to make sure that food insecurity isn't as big of a problem. There's a lot of solutions out here that when we put them together, we can help mitigate whatever happens at the federal level. I'll just be very brief. That, uh, yes, I, 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 I do believe that uh, I would really like that food pantry funding to go through. They play a vital role. There are a lot of organizations out there that, that, that help people in need. Um, it's a shame, and it's it's again unacceptable that any Iowan goes goes hungry. Um, just just a quick stat that really also kind of bothers me is that the United Way came out and said 40% of all Iowans can't provide the basics: shelter, clothing, or food. In the state, that's unacceptable, and we need to do tweak whatever we can, whatever programs are out there to make it better for for all of us. Uh, this is is going to be somewhat. Uh, Repetitive, but it's a little bit different twist, I think. It says, assuming we are stuck with Medicaid, and I'm reading the question, this isn't my opinion. Assuming we are stuck with Medicaid for profit privatization next year, how will you ensure MCOs will pay to improve the quality of LTSS services in the meantime? So I'm assuming if, if you go after changing the system, but you got to keep what you got until you get that done, how do you deal with it? improving quality or maintaining quality, right? Well, we kind of covered this before. Uh, just, you know, I'm hopeful that there's a, a new provider that's out there uh, that will take some of the burden from the other per two providers that are out there. Um, you know, we did pass legislation in regards to a simplification in regards to the process of being paid. Uh, there was some providers that required a fax, some requires a required email or mail. Uh, we. Uh, we, we wanted to standardize one form, which would help out the providers. Uh, and the most important thing is making sure that it's funded. Uh, it's a priority. It's a high, it's, it's I agree with Karen, in, a way, in somewhat, that it is, it should be fully funded. Uh, and it's disappointing what's been going on. The good news is, um, as a legislator, and John might be able to echo in on this comment, uh, that I'm not getting the emails that I was on a daily basis from not only the people that are dependent on that service, but the service providers. So I think it is kind of settled down, but I'm not gonna say that it's not broken. Well, one of the things when we, after we got the state Medicaid to a managed care system, about six months after we got going, we found out, of course, we had a lot of problems. So uh, we put together an oversight committee of both House and Senate members, and I actually serve on that committee to um, question the MCOs on how, why are you not paying providers? Why are you not denying services for patients? And uh, they could never really ever give us a straight answer. 
they give us these fancy reports that would be about this thick and tell us you know, how great things are going. But then when you dig into the report, which I did, and started asking those uh, questions, they couldn't answer them. And so what we're going to have to do, if, if we're going to stay with this system we have right now in January, uh, we're going to have to have more oversight from the legislative body, both in the House and the Senate. And yeah, my answer is simple. It's oversight. If we, if we are stuck with what we've got, the state has to, to have a much stronger oversight arm to ensure that we do make, keep our promises to the people of Iowa. One quick thing, uh, a couple years ago, there were only two inspectors who looked at nursing homes across the state of Iowa, two. And if you've traveled the state of Iowa, that's not enough. And so we have to make those investments, no matter what, to make sure that we are caring for all of our residents. Um, we, we, yes, we, we, we definitely need to, need to do, if, if we keep the, the system that's in place now, as, as previously said, we need to make sure that it has oversight, which again, kind of concerns me. We don't need more state oversight. We need to, um, uh, if, if the people are in place supposed to be taken care of, they need to do their job. If not, then we need to get rid of them. Um, we don't need to be giving them pay raises. Um, our, our people need to be taken care of, and all the people that I, I, I visit with, I mean, that they, their, their stories are real, and, and they just need to be taken care of in, in, in a man, timely manner. I agree with much as what, of what was said. I think if we're going to continue with it, you know, oversight's going to be key. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is I have not seen the contracts between the state and the MCOs, but I am sure that um, it includes some sort of a contractual obligation for them to actually pay the providers who provided these services. So I would just add to um, what other folks have said that we should enforce our contracts. Okay, one last question. And I want you to know we've addressed all the questions that came from the floor, and I'm going to ask for a 10% increase for my fee next year. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is, folks. Um, <laughs> I think we kind of touched on this, but explain the Apple tax breaks and will they ever pay taxes? <laughs> and that's a toss-up, as they say. Yeah, that's a pretty big toss-up. Um, if I understood the way the tax break system works, I would be running Apple or something right now, but I'm not. Um, at some point, they will pay taxes. They'll be here for a long period of time. Um, I think it's good for us to have them here. But, but giving away the farm for a company that didn't need the farm, I, I, that doesn't sit, sit right with me. Well, you know, uh, State of Iowa, we have about $500 million a year in tax credits that we give out to different groups and companies. And uh, this was a $20 million tax credit. So it's not like the state wrote a check to Apple for $20 million. They have to, they'll get it over a period of time. Um, personally, I don't think Apple needed the $20 million. Uh, they, they were coming here because of the great energy, low cost of energy we have here in the state of Iowa. Um, the governor decided just in the end to throw an, an extra 20 million in there to sweeten the deal and maybe get them here. But the number of jobs they're bringing into, into Waukee is very minimal. And then on top of that, the city of Waukee gave about another $180 million of tax breaks over the next 20 to 25 years. And I actually had a discussion with the mayor of Waukee about this, and um, he more or less told me that it wasn't really his decision, it was coming from above. So I assume that came from the governor's office too. So, um, you know, we, we do, we're gonna look at tax credits again next year in the Iowa legislature, and some of them are good, and some of them we're gonna have to really take a close look at because I don't think we're getting the value we need on these tax credits. No, it's a ripoff. To the taxpayers, I would include Facebook, I include the fertilizer plant. Secondly, it's not the governor's decision. This is a board uh, that's made up that makes these decisions on tax incentives, and I would have to, I, I have to defend to Governor, governor Reynolds. What would be your last comment? And here's something you don't hear politicians say every day. I don't know if Apple will ever pay taxes. I'm not sure any of us really know, but I would think that uh, at the end of the term, that yes, they'll be paying some taxes, certainly the, the, um, not as much as they need to be paying. The nice thing about it is during construction, 
all of the construction people on their income will be paying income taxes and, and, and those corporations will be paying taxes, but uh, Apple itself probably won't be uh, adding much to the state uh, treasury. Let me, uh, let me wind it up if I may. Uh, first of all, I think what is blatantly obvious to all of us, we have quality candidates. These are folks who really, really know, I think, uh, know as much as they can know in their circumstances. And I think we should be proud that we have this, this quality uh, of candidate person running for uh, our legislature. The second thing I want to underscore, and any of us who have held public office know that you have to be brave, maybe even courageous to run for public office. Ask Judge Kavanaugh. Um, yeah, that's not a partisan comment. Um, the issue that these folks have already identified is one of priority. So it's really, really important that you get to know your candidates and above all vote. And uh, with that, let's thank them very much for all they're doing.